everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. We're about to get started. We are so excited to go over the February market update. Uh, we got pushed back a little bit with the cold weather, um, trying to make sure everybody was settled back in. So we hope you're doing well from all of that. It was quite a crazy week to say the least, um, but we are going to talk about some things to look forward to in the next few months. So before we get started, we do want to go over our disclaimer like we do always. If you haven't been on here before, please make sure that you do your own due diligence before going into any deal. Um, we love to provide this educational content for you, and we do have fully licensed loan officers that are trusted advisors. If you want to go into more depth or talk about any deal specifics, we're happy to help you with that. Jeff, do you want to take it away? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Destiny. Um, so also welcome, Jeremy, who's not always on these uh, market updates. So thanks for joining us. Uh, drop some knowledge. So who we are, we are a one-stop shop for hard money um, and permanent financing loans. Um, so if you're a real estate investor and just starting your career, or you've been doing this for a while, give us a call. We can talk about your plans and your future. You get a one-on-one -on -one consultation for free. Um, we are a lender built by real estate investors. Um, you know, we do deals of our own, flips, rentals, wholesale deals. Um, Jeremy's division is solely, that is their sole focus is to find deals. So um, we have experience to kind of help you guys navigate through your deals. Um, you have a single point of contact model for all of our loan officers. Every one of them is individually licensed. So you'll have the same loan officer throughout the process from hard money to pre-approval to hard money to doing your permanent financing and sometimes even non-conventional financing. Um, you can normally be approved for multiple loan products with just one credit pool. Um, and we can get you pre-approved typically within 24 to 48 hours as long as you um, get your documents in. We review them quickly and get you pre-approval pre uh, fast so you can go out and shop for some, for, for some deals. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. Yes, and uh, a few other things we do provide both or all of hard money, conventional and non-conventional loans. We have 30-year fixed no income doc uh, landlord loans. So if you are... Um, not in a position where you have a W-2 job or maybe you're a full-time real estate investor, that product can be a great solution for you. As Jeff mentioned earlier, with the single point of contact model, we're able to do uh, all three of those. Um, we have primary refinance purchase and cash out options. We're gonna talk a little bit later about interest rates. They are going up, but still incredibly low. Um, I think it is still a great time if you have not taken advantage of those rates to get cash out of your property to fuel your real estate investment goals. Um, we have a lot of people who do that. They might have equity in their home that's dead. It's not doing anything for them. They can take 100,000, sometimes more out and use that money to either flip properties to earn immediate income or to buy and hold long-term rentals. Um, that non-conventional program, we even have one program that has FICO scores as low as 500. So if you have uh, less than perfect credit, and you also don't have documentable income, there are still solutions for you to add rentals. Um, we have hard money financing that starts as low as 6.99 and two points, some of the best pricing in town. We also have a really cool VIP flip program with rates as low as 9.99 and uh, options as low as one point. And one other thing that we do there is we go above the industry standard 70% LTV programs that are most common for flippers and we have some uh, flippers who can actually get as high as 75% on the LTV, which limits your out-of-pocket and increases your, your uh, returns because you are contributing less to each deal. And uh, Jeff mentioned this earlier, but uh, Jeremy's our guest today. He's been doing a great job of bringing off-market opportunities to our investors. So you definitely want to reach out to him and his team if you are struggling to find deals. That can be a great solution for you. And then before we uh, go any further, while it's on my mind, I do want to mention that we have exciting guests uh, coming up in the future from outside of our company, very knowledgeable people from the local uh, Texas market. So keep an eye out for who our guests are going to be on our future uh, presentations, because I think it, you guys will be really excited about some different ideas and some great presenters. Yeah, we're super excited about that. So make sure you're following us on Facebook and you are on our email list so that you can get updates whenever we start talking about who the speakers are going to be. And without further ado, let me introduce you to our panelists today. We have Wade Komar, founder and president. 
Uh, Wade started his career in 1995, and he has held titles such as president and vice president of leading sales and teams operations of up to 14,000 employees. He's a licensed real estate agent and active investor himself. We have our director of lending, Jeff Johnson. He manages all of our operations within Catalyst. He is uh, amazing at customer service. If you've ever wanted to talk to Jeff about anything, he could talk to you all day, um, but he is an excellent problem solver and he's really great at helping people with unique deals as well. Uh, Jeremy Humphrey, we talked about Jeremy a little bit and if you've joined any of our wholesale webinars, then you've heard Jeremy speak on his expertise. Um, but Jeremy is multifaceted. He is an experienced and active investor himself. He's also a licensed real estate agent. Are you still a licensed inspector as well? Yeah, <laughs> Jeremy's got, uh, got a lot of hats, um, but he is really excited and passionate about helping people get out of distressed situations and help investors find really great deals. So we are super excited to have all three of you on and hear about what new opportunities have arisen since the freeze and kind of where the market's heading. So we'll go ahead and jump into our February 2021 market update. Thanks, guys. Okay, thanks, Destiny. So yeah, like she said, there's a lot of topics to cover. Um, you know, Jeremy's here uh, to talk a lot about possible opportunities that are coming through because the freeze, and we'll get into that in the market. But but like Wade said earlier, we want to talk about interest rates first. Um, and I'll just kind of read off the chart here and then we can discuss, but it says last week, mortgage rates rose to the highest point since August of 2020. Uh, the average interest rate on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage went up to 2.97. Uh, and a year ago, the rate for a 30-year fixed mortgage was 3.45. So the, the fact that um, the rates went up to 2.97, yet this we were in this spot a year ago at 3.45, tells you just how much they've fallen in the last 12 months. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of opinions on why rates are going to go up, or what they did go up, and now they could go up. Um, the, the prevailing stuff that I read has a lot to do with the economy. Um, people feel like the economy is going to heat up this year um, with the COVID vaccine rolling out. Uh, parts of the economy will start to open back up, uh, which means people will spend more money. Um, so I think the the overall, from what I could tell at least, is that the, the overall reason why I think rates are going to go up is the economy is going to get better. Um, and inflation, too. Right. Anytime you have inflation, you're going to have um, you're going to have rising interest rates to try and slow it down. Um, you know, the, we're spending a lot of money uh, these days, and the more money you spend, uh, the more inflationary inflationary fears um, pop up. So, I, I really think those things are are driving what's 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 happening in, in the expectation. Now, the good news is that if you the things that I've read is that they expect, and this is this is not prediction. This is what I've read, uh, but they expect interest rates by the end of the year to settle in around about the same as what they were last year in the, in the mid threes, three four, three five, in that ballpark. So even though they expect rates to go up a little bit over the next twelve months, it's not going to be a huge spike, from what I can tell. Um, you know, folks that that haven't already refinanced still can refinance. And get a very good deal if you're looking to buy rental properties you know rental property rates are usually about a point higher than what you see out there advertised as the regular rate um so uh, yeah it's still a really good time to buy rental properties and investment properties um you know just a couple of years ago we were saying five percent or something like that was a great deal for for rentals so i don't expect um it to be that high this year to be honest with you i don't know if you guys have anything yeah add. definitely it's it's kind of a in my opinion it's often a lever right you have uh the economy slows and then the government tries to boost the economy by uh lowering the overnight lending rates um those things that is a it's kind of like a, a version of a stimulus package right and, and so with the economy heating up, we anticipate that will change. Inflation, to just point, is a huge indicator. And inflation generally happens whenever there's more money put into the system, right? And uh, it, it's an interesting number, but in uh, the entire 2007 financial crisis, $700 billion 
was the total relief package. And uh, just this last relief package is proposed to be 1.9 trillion. So, uh, and there've already been multiple relief packages in advance of that. So it's easy sometimes whenever you hear all these big numbers being thrown around to, to kind of lose uh, an understanding of how big these things are. And even in, if you converted with inflationary numbers 2007 to now, it's so significantly smaller it's unbelievable. And that was the largest relief package by far in history. So uh, even in relative terms, right, relative to the, the, the value of the dollar at that given time to what it is today. So it's, it's hard to not anticipate that that is going to cause inflation, which almost always has a, a direct correlation in increasing interest rates. So uh, it's hard to not anticipate that if you're going to put that much more money in the system. Yeah. Now, point, sorry. I was going to say, yeah, I, I do think despite that, I do think Rates are still really low to cash flow yeah. by rental properties. Well, my, my point was um, that I was going to make is that while they are higher than they were last, you know, a uh, few months, they're better than last year. And um, I still think that if you're looking where should I wait on doing deals until it goes back down to 2.97, the odds of that happening are very low because, uh, or even, I'm sorry, below 2.97, the odds of that happening are very low because it's never happened before. Conversely, the odds of it going up are significant. So I, I just, I think if you're looking, at, do I want to wait or time the market? You have a lot more potential for rates to go up, not just a little bit significantly. There's very little room for them to go down. And then again, you would be at historic lows. So I've heard a few people saying, I'm going to wait until rates go back down on deals. And those are newer people probably, but um, I still I still think that that's probably the wrong perception. It's like uh, trying to say when the stock market's at a historic high, uh, I, I think it's going to continue to go up. There's more downside than upside when you're at a historic high. Next slide, please. <laughs> so this is a chart we've shown a couple times before, but it kind of reiterates and quantifies what uh, uh, we we're talking about in the previous conversation when it comes to interest rates and where they've been historically. Um, you know, this is a, a good look at where they've been. Um, I think that's the early eight. I can't, the bottom of this chart cuts out for me. I can't see the timelines, but it looks like the early eighties when it was in the 18% and it's been a steady decline or a steep decline for the first 10 years. And then it's been a steady decline there. So this is just more of a perspective than anything else. People get caught up in the here and the now, and they kind of lose perspective on where things have been, where they could be. And this is a great reminder that we are lucky to be buying deals where we are right now with the money as cheap as it is because you know, go try and try and cash flow when you're paying 14% on a, on a, you know, on a rental, it's tough. Um, so, so keep that in perspective when you're, when you're looking at, Hey, should I buy deals or not? This is still a really good time to get into the market. Yeah. The, the bottom line to your point is the cash flow, right? If you're still making really strong cash flow at the current interest rates and they're locked in on a 30 year mortgage, it's very good. Another thing I will mention is if you lay down historic inflation rates on top of a chart that shows historic interest rates, the highest inflation rates were at that time whenever rates were in that 15 to 18% range, like it's just a direct correlation. So um, I would anticipate them continuing to increase over time. Um, so the next chart we're talking about here is, uh, you know, Texas and how it is doing in regards to growing population or decreasing. And I want to talk a little bit about why we always talk about this. The reason we talk about it <clears throat> is not just to brag, as Texans often like to do, but it's primarily because of how it impacts prices, right? If, if people are continually moving into your state and you're unable to uh, build enough homes to keep up with the increases in population, then it causes prices to rise, right? There's two ways that prices can rise. Um, one is you just don't have nearly enough uh, people are moving out of your state, but you're not building enough homes, which, you know, according to this article and others is what's happening in California. They just don't build very many homes. But here, conversely, population is growing and we're still building more homes, but you can't keep up with demand. So prices are almost always a supply demand response. And there's several reasons that, you know, we almost find a different article every month talking about this, this uh, positive situation for Texas. But, um, you can see all the states where people are moving in, and Texas is always on this list, normally in the top two for the number of new residents, new net residents every year. 
And the article does mention that Texas imposes fewer restrictions on home building than California. And then this was shocking to me. Like I, I knew that there were big differences in the new home building, but the fact that just the DFW area is building more new homes than the entire state of California really explains why, one of the many reasons why their prices are so high. They just do not build very many homes relative to us. They have comparable space, but there are a lot more restrictions on new home construction and the amount of green space you have to have and other things. Pros and cons to everything, your political opinions aside, but the net result is that we are able to build a lot more properties here and that's kept prices down. A um, couple other exciting things that should continue to boost prices, and we're going to cover all the major metros here, but you really see it impacting everywhere is that uh, Houston, Dallas, and in Austin in particular, are definitely corporate hubs. And then you see a lot more corporations moving into the area because it's also a positive environment for businesses. So we had Hewlett Packard move to Houston, Oracle moved to Austin, you know, Tesla moved a lot of operations to Texas. So just a lot of exciting things from major corporations that provide great jobs, great incomes, and then the opportunity for people to pay more for homes, which should continue to prop up the real estate market. Yeah, there's, so you were talking about, um, New construction, and I found this on a text and m article. Um, they they measure a couple of things. The actual construction activity <clears throat> was relatively flat in 2020 for a bunch of different reasons. However, there's a leaning indicator index that they that kind of factors in um, interest rates, <clears throat> building permits, housing starts. It kind of it kind of throws all of those combinations into or all those factors into one combination and it is the um highest it's ever been it's called the uh, construction cycle i'm sorry the uh, residential construction leading index so it's never been higher so to wade's point you know there's a shortage of it we'll get into this but there's a, sh a massive shortage of inventory in the state everywhere basically but you know texas is very um business friendly and allows a lot of new builds so you know we are in a, you're going to see a ton of new properties hit the market when it comes to new construction. They're they're building as fast as they can right now. Um, the other thing it was called a new it was a new vacant developed lots. Basically, it's a, a study to show um, how many lots are being developed. And you know, back in 2000 and I think six was when it was at its height. It is it is basically up to like 80% of where it was in 2006. So they are really trying to catch back up. You know, we haven't been we haven't been building as a state. We haven't been building a lot of a lot of, a lot of properties um, lately over the last 10 years or so. There just haven't been a lot of new construction, but they are trying to play catch up. And so it's it's going crazy right now. Sorry, go ahead and next slide. Yeah, a fun segue between these last two slides is this one, that bottom point on this slide is how HB is moving to Houston. And that that will bring in a lot of millennials and like the younger tech generation to Houston. And if you want to go to the next slide, Destiny, that the next this next slide talks about how we are um, as millennials. And this is a, a national graph. Did you say uh, we are? We. Yeah, me, I know. <laughs> as, as millennials are really hitting the, our strides to where we're able to purchase homes and like becoming a big segment of the buyer's market. Can you hit the next slide, Destiny? Um, You're a loser? Oh, there we go. All right, so this is, uh, this first bullet point is uh, not solely, um, not solely millennials, it is Americans as a whole, but the number of Americans who considered a home, uh, considered purchasing a home uh, 12 months ago versus now is 15%, and that is 4% higher than it was a year ago. So it's thinking through the COVID response. There was, you can, this chart goes from 2017 to, today and you can see that red 10 percent that's toward the center right that was q1 of 2020. people were like pump the brakes i don't know what to do i don't know if we should buy homes i don't know if we shouldn't there's a lot of fear there and then it has trended upwards every quarter since then um, we've talked about this before but the the demand for space the demand to get out of apartments to get away from other people the work from home like we all most of us, Jeff's not, looks like, um, but a lot of us working from home, so we want to have the space to have an office. There's a lot of different things that are driving this, but long story short, people do want to have homes, and I think it's coupled with the millennials, which is the next point, 
the share of millennials planning to purchase a home rose 8% to 27%. So just our generation is old enough, has enough money, has the income and all of that to be able to purchase those homes. Yeah, but, uh, I, I think I read something that said, I'm sorry, I think I just, on millennials, I think I read something that said millennials are literally the largest group ever. When you, when you, you know, boomers and Gen X and all that stuff, like millennials are the largest group that we have. And they're like right in that sweet spot for home buying. We're, we're, we're catching up quickly. So it says the share increased six points to 18% among Gen Xers and then three points 16, uh, to 16% among Gen Z. Um, and then the baby boomers were flat at 27%. So yeah, you're right. Millennials are 27% of the buying population and then Gen Xers are 18, which is the next closest. All right, so new opportunity. We wanna talk about the impact of the freeze a couple of weeks ago and what that looks like for me, you know, as running the investors, the wholesaling division, but then more specifically for most of you who are watching, who are going to be the investors that want to buy these properties, what does it look like for you? So there's two opportunities. One is anytime, like if you think through Harvey or you think through all of the, the recent history floods, that's a time where there are many, many homes that hit the market or off market all at the same time. So it is an opportunity to transfer wealth from the vast majority of people that all own these homes to the much smaller population of investors who are able to purchase these homes. That brings up the next opportunity is there's, these are Texans that had their houses freeze and we want to help them. People are in distress. They have their homes flooded. They don't know what to do. They've never been through the situation. They don't have the access to contractors and capital like we do. We can be someone that comes in and helps them and saves them out of this situation. It's there's a there's a very short window of time where all this happened and people haven't quite figured out what's insurance going to cover, what is it not going to cover, how does this affect my loan, what's my payoff. There's a lot of figuring out to do, but very, very quickly, and it's already happened, but very quickly people are going to decide, yeah, I'm just going to walk away from the home, take the insurance money, get my loan payoff, and sell it off to an investor. Sell it to someone who's able to fix this. This is the perfect time for us to be able to come in and help our fellow Texans. Yeah, I, I would add to that <clears throat> that um, we were cautious during the flood with flipping those properties. And in many markets, it was a good decision. In some markets, it wasn't. I think we could have been more profitable as a company if we had flipped more houses during the flood. But we also did avoid some neighborhoods that um, were multiple flooded. And you know those homes really struggled. Flippers struggled to sell those properties that had flooded multiple times. So I think one thing that we learned is that if it, it's a single flood, sometimes that can, uh, buyers are less afraid of that. So whenever I extend that knowledge that we gained and to this, this particular situation, this was a storm that according to all records, uh, it, it hadn't been this cold in 125 years. So I don't know that this is gonna be commonplace, right? And honestly, the geography of the home impacts the probability of, of uh, freezing again or having freezing pipes very little. Like, don't get me wrong, homes on the north side of Houston got colder than they did on the south side. But the largest, indicator of a home flooding is is arguably the things that the owner or the tenant does at that time right how you prepare the things that you do the type of maybe piping in the home does have an impact where the most part there are ways that you can avoid a lot of it with some preparation not completely we had some people in our company who who did everything right some things still happen don't get me wrong but um i don't know that this is something that you should say uh i am not going to buy homes in houston or texas across the board because a storm happens every 125 years and, and um, you know, we're going to have busted pipes. So whenever you say all that, what that does lead to is, I think, discounted opportunities because people can't help themselves just like the floods, oftentimes comparable repairs, but not a reason to be as afraid of investing in those homes. So I do think this is a great opportunity to invest while also helping people who probably don't have solutions like Jeremy said. Yeah. I mean, this is a case like a perfect case of 
why do people sell properties off market? I mean, this is 101, right? They have a property that they, they typically can't afford to fix a lot of times um, or don't want to fix. So um, it's a great opportunity for investors to pick up properties um, and help out sellers, right? They don't have faith. If, think about it, if their house looks like that picture right there and they don't have the money to fix it and they're getting um, no insurance help, what, what are they gonna do? They don't have a lot of options. So it's, it's, it's a win-win for everybody. Um, so if you're not pre-approved, give us a call and we can get you pre-approved so you can start acting on these deals. Cause I would not, I would not expect it to take too long for these deals to start hitting the market. Jeremy, I don't know if you've had any people that you've any, any direct sellers you talked to so far that have been affected by this or not. Um, have you? We've had, we've had many conversations with them. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of them are figuring out what's my insurance going to do. How are they going to help me with this? Are they not going to help me with it? How much will I get? So there's there's a lot of people that are close to making that decision. We have not personally got any of them yet, yeah. um, but they're coming. It's undeniable. They're definitely going to be. Yeah. I mean, think about it. If you've talked to people, I'm sure other people have talked to people, and they've made that decision. I need to I need to sell this house. So um, you know, it could be it could be a a big boom as far as deals coming on the market. I have a good little data set to figure out like how much time it should take because I had four different insurance claims I had to make. So talking well, through the insurance adjusters and, and getting them out there and all of that, I'm, I'm able to see across four different data sets very personally how much time it should take or I would know if, like if I were thinking about some homes, I would know it's going to take this much time before I'm able to make that decision. Got it. Okay. So, uh, Houston, there. what's that? A little positive after having four houses that had insurance. That definitely sucks. There's no way around that, but hopefully everything goes all right. Um, so, Houston, the, I'll, I'll read through these and we can kind of talk about it. So, uh, single family home sales is more of the same, basically. Single family home sales increased for the eighth consecutive month, up almost 28% year over year with 6,000 units sold. The days on market dropped um, from 69 well, a year ago to 48. That's uh, for you guys that don't know, days on market is um, how long it typically takes to get a property under contract. Um, total property sales shot up 27 and a half percent with 7,500 units sold. That's including everything, not just single family. Um, total, dollar, total dollar volume was up 43%, which is just bonkers to 2.3 billion. And that's what happens when you get a lot more sales and all of the sales are more expensive, right? It's just, it is a massive amount of volume pumping out of the city every month. Um, single family average price was a January high, um, up 12 and a half percent to 326. That's the average. Uh, the median price jumped another 12% to 263, which is also a January high. So they've literally never been higher as far as at least the January is concerned in the history of the city. Um, single family homes, month of inventory registered a record low of 1.8 months of supply. That is down from 3.3 before the pandemic and below the national inventory of 1.9. So we are officially lower than the national average, um, which is typically not the case. Uh, and just for you guys that don't know, a month of inventory a market is considered in balance if it's somewhere between six and six and a half months of inventory. We are at the 1.8 mark. Um, so meaning if nobody else listed their properties, it would we, every house would sell in less than two months. And then lastly, single family home rentals fell 18%, the average rent up 6%. So um, there were fewer transactions happening as far as leases go, but the cost of the rent was up um, almost $1,900 a month. So, um, you know, as far as a little color, it's just, it's more of the same, right? There's just, every, what we were talking about earlier, everybody is wanting to either move in to Texas from other states because they see it as a great, just great way to live, great opportunity to get in on cheap real estate, relatively speaking to, the, to maybe where they're coming from. Uh, or people that are renting, wanting to move into their space because they want to get their own space because of COVID, they just 
they want to get out of a close confinement or i think a couple of different things a rates are just really low so it's easier to buy and or um upgrade and with with a lot of folks as you can see wade and jeremy working from the house a lot of people want to work from the house and they and the pandemic has you know forced people to do that and shown that people can do that so they want to they want a little more space right you got kids running around or you need your office you need some you're going to spend a lot more time at your house you want more space to do the things you need to do so it's causing like a, a, a move up the chain right you're going from apartments to maybe a new house families going from a smaller house to a bigger house because they need the space and all of that along with low interest rates and millennials hitting the market just kind of a perfect storm um driving these prices up because nobody wants to sell either they many reasons a lot of it is due to covid they don't want people in their house so the inventory is tight nobody's selling and it's just it's compounding um reasons as to why the, the values are going up um next slide please so this is a um this is houston broken out by segment and if you look it literally goes from the lowest to the highest and every segment is a little bit better um, the zero to 99,000 was down 32%. So that just tells me you cannot find houses in that range. Um, same thing for one to, one to 150, down 23%. So even though the overall market sold 27% more houses, those two segments were down um, 32 and 23%. Respectively. So there's just, there's not a lot of houses in that price point anymore. Um, you know, it's going to get, as, as prices go up, it's just going to get worse and worse in those segments. Uh, 150 to 250 is up 11 percent. Then 250 to half a million, which I believe is the biggest bucket, was up 62 percent. Um, 500 to 750 up 70 percent, and 750 above is up 70 percent. So just massive. That, that contributes to that volume number we were talking about earlier. Massive um, amount of deals being sold in the upper ranges. Um, and people can afford those houses, um, you know, mostly because of low interest rates. Or if they're moving from out of town, they're coming with a lot of equity. They can put a lot of money in, um, and you know, be able to afford a house in that half a million dollar range because they're they're coming from California, where they just pocketed a couple hundred grand possibly from selling their property. Um, but this is just kind of more of, more of the same what we've been seeing for the past six months. We talked about the U-Haul data a couple of times ago. Um, oh, yeah. Pricing that they, you know, that it costs to rent one from California to Houston versus the other way around. And, and to your point there, with those luxury markets, 750 up and even 500 to 750, just jumping drastically. Interest rates, people being able to afford them into that, but all, along with some of the California money coming in, is making a big difference on the the number of people purchasing those homes. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and honestly, like, you know, it's unfortunate, but in my opinion, a lot of the economic pain on the because of COVID has been felt on the lower paying jobs. And so the, the folks that are at the higher end of the spectrum, they are, it's nothing but green for them. Everything is, um, you know, unless you're low on the gas, everything is, is going well and you can afford it's cheaper and you can afford those properties because of interest rates. Yeah, that is true. Um, so this this next slide, um, Jeff's covered a lot of it. I am going to cover a few things and, and give an opinion on some things, but I'm just a big, I talk a lot about the supply and demand, and I think that's what drives this all the time. And um, eventually it will slow down, but I think you can always look at leading indicators to see when that could potentially happen. Um, so what are your leading indicators to see whenever things may slow down? Well. We've been saying for some time that the fact that the active listings are down may impact that, but there's so much velocity. Homes are selling so quickly that it just has not really made an impact. If you look at the total active listings now versus uh, a year ago, it's down 31%, but still the volume is up significantly. The total number of sales is up significantly. So uh, I think until demand really starts to slow down, you're just going to see that 1.8 potentially go down a little bit. Uh, from where it is now unless there's more inventory that starts to come on the market or some of these new homes start to come onto the market so that is very good for people who want to flip properties and it's it's also a, a good thing for appreciation for people who own rentals 
Um, the 34.5 percent pending sale increase is a really big number. Um, and that would seem to indicate that this is not going to slow down for the foreseeable future, less at least 60 days. That's a very yep. good looking indicator for the closings in the next 60 days. And um, I, there's nothing on these charts thus far that say that that uh, it's going to slow down. I guess the biggest factor is how our rates going to impact it. And um, since they're still so low, I think it's going to have to go up more before it really starts to impact the real estate market significantly. Because still at this point, we're arguably the lowest we've ever been. If they go up a point or two, then then I think you'll see an impact for sure. Um, you know, the the other thing that we've talked about in the past is how is the uh, potential foreclosure market going to impact things. And for those of you that have been on previous calls, there is debate on that. You know, we had a very smart person uh, on our uh, meeting last week that felt that that was going to be a more significant impact. Um, we did talk a little bit about differences and forbearances and how they're being handled or how they're proposed to be handled versus how they were handled in 2007. So if you are concerned about that, I do encourage you to research the differences because this time we understand that the government is going to add payments onto the end of the mortgage, which is completely different than whenever there are tons of foreclosures on the market and the prices dropped previously, whenever people were required to pay all four parents payments immediately. That is a drastic difference. If you think someone hasn't been able to make a single payment in 12 months, how are they going to make 12 payments in one month? It's some, somewhat preposterous, honestly. Like the chances of that happening are almost non-existent. So uh, that, that was just a bad decision. I think we all recognize that was not the best way to handle it. I think this time they're going to tack them on to the end. And so really all the person has to do is say, now I've got my job back or we're outside of the pandemic, their lower medical costs, whatever it may be. All I have to do is start making regular payments again. That is a much more manageable situation for a lot of these people. Now, some of them, both parties may have lost their job. That would be the people that you'll start to see come in as foreclosures eventually if there's just no way to start making payments again. In my opinion, that is a drastically different number of future foreclosures as a percentage of existing forbearances than what happened before. So that's that's something that you do want to keep in mind with all these numbers. Um, anything to add to that before I move on to? Am I? I was just about the foreclosures. I was um, one of our other podcasters, AG, posted something that was pretty interesting. He's talking about a lot of newer real estate investors are kind of waiting for the avalanche of foreclosures. Um, and he cited a stat um, of all the, the properties that are out there, you know, the percentage of homes that are actually in foreclosure um, is, and have been abandoned, like just given up on this, on this process is really, really low. Um, so I, I do agree that I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't know if we're gonna see this massive influx of foreclosures anytime soon. I sure they wouldn't wait around if I wanna be a real estate investor. If it happens, it happens, but it, in lieu of that, I wouldn't stop buying properties in anticipation of it because you never know what's going to happen. One other thing I would add on that is more going going back to the looking forward, trying to figure out what's going to happen in the next few months. If you look at the, you mentioned the total uh, active listing dropped 31. Um, as long as you keep that relative to the days on market, you and those continue to move together, then that that does give you a pretty good indication of what's happening because if if days on market doubles again and it's like well now it's three months on market but the total active listing stays low then that tells you something different versus if they're moving parallel to each other um, just because they're they're moving quicker that's why there's fewer active listings kind of a fun thing to compare the two agree okay uh san antonio and I'll talk a little bit about the type of market San Antonio is. You know, San Antonio is much more similar to Houston than it is to certainly Austin or, or even Dallas in that it is a really strong rental market with great cash flows, lower prices, higher rents relative to the prices of homes. So when you're, if you're going to invest all over the state, that is something important to keep in mind. But while it is not appreciating as quickly as Austin, and the uh, the days on market are not as uh, 
impressive as Austin's. In other words, you know, Austin is just has very little inventory, far far less than any of the other major cities in Texas. It's still a a rapidly growing place, and you can see that here. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the percentages, but uh, the sales are up 22 percent, average price up 15 percent, median price up 14 percent. Um, the the uh, price per square foot is up 12 percent as well. Um, and then whenever you look at the days on market, it's down 30 percent. So what are all these numbers telling us? It's a, it's a rapidly appreciating market. That Those are very unusual appreciation numbers for the state of Texas. Normally, state of Texas is more steady, not as many big ups, not as many big downs. So that's a very big number. Um, days on market is down significantly. That means things are the velocity that we talk about in other markets is definitely there. And then the residential rental market is not doing as is not increasing as quickly, right? But if you think about who, who's handling the or who is renting those properties to just point earlier, they're often um, they may have been more impacted by COVID, right? Um, the, the more white collar jobs, often people who own homes, it has been less impacted, and you're seeing that appreciation in that area. But it's logical to see that there wouldn't be quite as much rental price appreciation, but it's still there. You know, it's up four percent. Um, it's still a relatively hot market in that um, the days market is down 30 percent last year on rentals. There are few uh, fewer sales, so you know there's a lot of indicators that that um, it is still somewhat of a, a, a tighter market, but it's appreciating there. But that is one thing I, I would not anticipate your rent rates appreciating as quickly in the current environment, at least. But I do not I do not think 15% is going to be the new normal for home price appreciation in San Antonio either. Like that's a those are the type of numbers that eventually have to correct themselves. But I don't think the market factors are uh, once some of the new homes come under the market and there's a little bit less demand once that bounce out you know I, I would be very surprised if it becomes a long-term trend of 10 percent plus in any of these houston i mean any of these uh texas markets yeah like you said i think san antonio is very similar to houston it's more of a it's a great rental market i've seen a few national charts that had it you know top 10 as far as places to own rentals, so along with Houston. So um, even though they're appreciating at a pretty good clip, it's still it's still a good rental property market for sure. We have the North Texas Houston or housing report, sorry. Um, it's a lot of the same. So our Texas wide Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, a lot of these are very positive trends, the same thing. So the median price in Dallas um, went up 12.7% year over year. So that's January 20 versus this January. Days on market is 48 days. Um, closed sales gone up 17.8%. That's 24,795 in January. And then the active listings dropped 43%. So again, we talked about that a couple slides ago. But when that month's of inventory is 1.6, you will also expect to see the active listings dropping significantly. So um, I don't know, I don't want to make another point that's already been said, but just a very similar trend across every city that these are all positive numbers where we're moving up very quickly in value. Yeah, well, we'll get to Austin in a second, but there's not a single market that's below 10% uh, for last year or the year over year, January to January numbers. So pretty impressive. Am I covering Austin? This is you, Wade. Me, sorry, my apologies. I was uh, <laughs> we went out of order. <laughs> I did. I was I was ready to pass the baton. Um, <laughs> so speaking of Austin, um, this is the highest appreciation number. That market is incredibly hot. Lots of businesses moving there from all over the country, especially California. So um, you can see that growth, 19%. That's that's amazing. Um, closed sales up 23%. Average days on market. Uh, down significantly. Um, new listings is not, you know, that's down 11%. Like we said, uh, active listings down 70. So there's not a lot on the market, but pending sales are still up, which is a leading yeah. indicator for number of sales over the next 60 days or so. Total sales volume. So that is a, uh, there's a lot of factors for that, but it's up 53%. In my mind, those factors are one, homes are just selling for more up 20%. Uh, and as we've seen in Houston and other markets, there's a lot more activity in the higher price points, right? So that's why this sales volume 
is a lot higher than it usually is. And that market, often it's just slower. You know, the homes don't move that quick. That's why we and others have often said, you know, that high end flip market, you really have to know what you're doing. You have to be well capitalized or it can be dangerous. But those areas are selling very quickly across the state. And then this is a, a very impressive number, 1.3 months. Uh, I'm sorry, 0.4 oh, months. Is that right? Yes, Holy no, months. No, yeah. Wow. I, I was I was just I went to the number the 1.3 because I thought it was impossible to be 0.4, but the opposite. Yes. Yeah. That is crazy. But I have heard from a lot of people. I know real estate investors in that town and um and people I know one person is looking to get a house. In fact, one of our teammates here at Catalyst, uh his other was looking for a property there. And um, if you do not make an offer immediately, sight unseen, you are just not going to be able to buy a house in Austin right now. It's really incredible how quick, like uh, in Houston and San Antonio and Dallas, you know, you're still, there's a couple showings now. You may only have a weekend before you, that home is sold. But in Austin, as I understand it, people are making sight unseen offers, putting up earnest money, everything just based on the pictures. And uh, then, you know, then they get in and actually look at it. So that's, that's a unique and very, very hot market that uh, we aren't seeing in the other parts of the state. Well, I was looking at this, though. The only thing that I would like, Searching for a negative somewhere because everything's in positive. So in Houston, the pro the property sales were up like 28 percent, and pending sales are like 35 percent, right? So it's the pending sales are, are nice and high. Here it's it's the pending sales are only up 15 percent relative to 23 percent on the first. So I don't know if you think that's that an indicator this one might be slowing down. We're eventually running out of inventory. Uh, well, you've got a you've got to multiply those pending sales by four because we are at 1.8 and they're at 0.4 months. So really, I think that's still a hotter market. You can't just look at pending sales. Those pending sales are turning over four times as often, right? So I think it's still that velocity number just comes into play. It, it's hard to wrap your mind around all those different factors, but velocity is king. You're not going to have as many pending sales if they're just turning over so damn quick, you know? So I, I don't know. I mean, it, it should arguably still take the same amount of time. But uh, yeah, if you look at the number too, you're right. Like Houston, relative, like Houston pending sales is 8,800 and sales was 7,500. So it's still same kind of ratio. There's a lot more pending sales than closed sales. Yeah. Left, so yeah, no, probably either. Oh, yeah, I get what you're saying. No, if people eventually stop putting homes on the market, then there will be no homes to sell. <laughs> you know, I guess that may eventually happen there because it's just happening so quick. But um, I guess you have any interest in selling at all in Austin. You, there's a lot of people probably think this is the time to do it, you know, because it's so freaking hot. Yeah. Next slide, please. So this was a report um, from Texas a and They do a great job on real estate stats. Um, this was kind of an annual summary for 2020, and I picked a couple of little bullet points that I thought were interesting. Um, you know, no surprise, if you look at the summary, there was 9% year-over-year increase. Um, you know, what's causing that? Things we already talked about, demand for space, low interest rates, more of Jeremy's people trying to buy houses, and, uh, and less people um, listing properties, right, because of COVID. Um, Months of inventory, again, six and six to six and a half is considered normal. You know, the state is at 1.7, um, which is, like I said, is finally below the national average. And Austin for the year was 0 0.6. Uh, I just thought that was crazy and didn't even realize that it was lower now. Um, and then credit, which I thought was interesting. If you look at credit, and I don't know if you guys have any comments on this, but so refinance growth expected to decline in 2021 because you know, rates have gone up and there are fewer people to pull from, right? Rates have been low for a couple of years now. A lot of folks have refinanced. Um, but I thought this was the interesting part. Despite the pandemic, the average, and this is based on um, Fannie Freddie data, the, the average borrower quality has gotten better over the last 12 months. The average FICO has gone up uh, eight points and the average debt ratio, which is a measure of you know, families debt versus their income has gone down 2% as well. Um, and I, I, you know, from what I read, the factors were a lot, A, people not going anywhere, 
you're able to you just spend less money so maybe the people can retire some debt um people that did get stimulus checks a lot of them put it in savings or paid off credit card debt um to increase their, their that would increase their credit score and lower the debt ratio um, and then people refinancing typically if you're going to do a lot of times they do a refi cash out to lower their payments which would allow them to um pay off more debt or they do like a debt consolidation because they have a lot more equity now values are going up they can use that money to pay off more credit card debt so so the, the quality of borrowers that you're seeing is is rising which i thought was interesting over the last year uh next slide and that is a another good indicator in my opinion that the the there are going to be foreclosures the, the only question is how many right is it going to be a an, an amount that causes home prices to drop is it going to be an amount that just causes the market to cool from a 12 percent or 20 percent in austin my guess is cooling is is more the indicator because you have so many factors the difference in how forbearances are handled and the the objective uh view that it seems like people's financial situations and, and many from this data is is actually improving they have less debt to pay that debt to income ratio is better and their overall scores are going up so that that's uh that's possible yep so uh prices uh kind of like we talked about texas medium price up eight percent 259 the 247 percent increase over last year that's pretty good um home price appreciation index was up 5.2 in 2020 um so that 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 home price appreciation I should add some color to that number. That is the price of existing homes. So it kind of removes new construction and says, okay, if you if somebody bought an existing home, how much did that price go? And that went up five percent. So they, they, that is a true, a really good indicator of the increase in. Like you buy a house, you buy a rental property. You know what can you expect? Last year you could expect your value to go five percent. Um, delinquency. So I wanted to get y'all's opinion on this. 8% of Texans were behind on their mortgage. 7% nationally, you know, no big deal, 1%. But Houston was at 12%. So Houston is is feeling it a little more, I guess, than the mm -hmm. average of the country. I don't know if you had any, I couldn't find any good research that tells me why Houston was feeling it. I don't know if you had any opinions I, on I think it. It's a combination of COVID and oil and gas industry has been impacted. So there, there are people that are definitely, uh, you know, I think Texas has stayed a little bit more open, so probably there have probably been fewer job losses just from COVID, but the oil and gas pain has been real over the last year. So um, that, that I think has impacted that number. I have to agree with that. Oil, oil and gas was a, definitely the first thing in my mind. Yep, so that, that is the leading indicator to keep an eye on. Um, and I, I uh, you know, there have been some changes to policy on on oil and gas so that could be something that that we definitely want to keep an eye on on future jobs in houston and across the state that could be impacted by policy so that number uh could could potentially go up a little bit if, if it is further impacted so um that's a statistic that whenever we were rolling through these that was a surprising number to me that it was that much higher yeah i wonder if the freeze is going to affect that um Okay, so this last one here that I thought was pretty interesting is the affordability index. It's it is it is um, it's a measure of of how much house the the median household can afford relative to like what they make and how much the price and the housing is in in a city. Um, so it's defined by the median what me, the median income can afford percentage over the median sales price. Um, so higher prices are offset by low mortgage rates. So the affordability was, you'd think it'd be you'd places would be more affordable to live because rates have gone down, but the prices have gone up so much, it's kind of kept the affordability flat for Texas. However, Houston was the most affordable major market in the country with a 1.9. Um, that, is, that is pretty remarkable. If you think that the the median income, the, the median household could afford um, to pay ninety percent more than the median sales price and still afford to live there, which is which is really really good. Uh, Fort Worth was one point eight, 
And then Austin, Dallas, and San Antonio are 1.7. So Houston was the best in the country. And those four markets were not too far behind. So when we talk about prices going up, this kind of keeps things in perspective. Even though prices in Houston have gone up a lot over the last 12 months, it is still, by this definition, the most affordable place to live uh, when you're considering major metros. One other interesting thing is that whenever you see how much more homes cost in Austin, and they're still at 1.7, that tells you how much higher the income level is there. Yeah, I was really surprised to see Austin and San Antonio the same. Yeah, I, I would. I was very surprised by that as well. That's that's kind of a very surprising number. They must be making significantly more money. A lot of those tech jobs coming in have, must be very high paying jobs. Sure. Looks like it. Okay. Next slide. I know we, we want to get to a few questions. So I think if we can all move through these a little bit more efficiently, that would be great. Um, I'm going to mention one thing on this slide. Um, if you look at how the existing home, existing median price uh, versus the new median price, the new median price is relatively flattened out, but that existing median price has really been increasing rapidly. And that is where a significant portion of the, uh, the price gains are coming from. That, that it, It's very surprising to see how close those two trend lines are coming together. So if you bought a home that was worth 135 in 2011, you know, you're talking 255, that is, an impressive amount of appreciation for that time frame, right? So, uh, yeah, it's exciting stuff. Anyway, uh, we'll go to the next slide. So this one here, single family housing construction permits, kind of talks about, what, it points to two things we were discussing last, earlier in the call. One, so if 100 is the baseline, meaning whatever was going on in 2000 is 100, if you see the, the housing boom, right, in the early 2000s, and then you had the crash, and then nobody was building any properties. Like we said, if they've been below that number for 12, 15 years now almost. Um, and they started to spike back up, right? Uh, a couple of years ago, it got back to par, and that, that trend, especially in Texas, that is a pretty steep line right there. So I, I think new housing construction is going to be a big story in the next couple of years. And last slide. One more slide is the is housing it? sales price by, by price code. Sorry, housing sales by price cohorts. So this it's similar data to what we spoke about earlier, just a way of looking at it. So we see that blue line is zero to 200 and that those sales have gone down. Every other price cohort has gone up in sales. So red is 200 to 300, purple is 500 plus. You see a very steep increase right around 2019. You see that that 500 plus jumping very dramatically. Uh, 300 to 400, similar thing. It's a very solid increase in that 2019 mark. It jumps dramatically and then even the 400 to 500. So, um, Aside from the 200 and under, which is simply because there's very little, very few of those homes to be sold, everything else is trending very positively. Yeah. For the up. Yes. All right, I hop back on because we do have quite a few questions. Um, thank you guys so much for being a part of our webinars. We really enjoy having a live audience and we love the feedback and questions. If you haven't had an opportunity to write in your question yet, but you do have one, you should find the question box on your right or left hand side of your screen, depending on the device that you're using. Make sure to write it in and we'll try to answer it. We are hitting our one o'clock. Um, so if anyone has to go, we appreciate you. You will get a copy of the webinar. Um, but if you want to stay and join us for some questions, please do. So our first question, um, this one is quite long, so I'm, and I think some of it might be better answered um, by an individual loan officer, but I will ask the first part, um, and then we can see about going further. So this starts out with, if a house is bought with cash, how soon can I cash out, re how soon can I cash out refinance? Would it make a difference if it were a primary or an investment property? That's part one of the question. So you have to wait six months, uh in order to get cash out if you pay cash for the property. It's called delayed financing. Um, 
almost all of the investment gurus, mentors really discourage that. And, and shameless plug here, I'm going to make it. They normally encourage using hard money lenders because then your capital is not tied up as long. Um, if you think about it, uh, let's just say you have $200,000 to start investing in single family real estate and you go out and find a property and you pay cash for it and you finance your own repairs. I could arguably eat up your entire opportunity for six months. Conversely, that 200,000 could um, translate into buying eight properties in that same six month time frame. So your velocity is far greater when you take advantage of that financing. Now, are you going to pay more points of fees? Absolutely, there's, you know, there's a cost of financing, but the ability to uh, become a very active investor with more limited funds is greatly impacted by using a different type of financing. Six months is a long time to have your money tied up. Thank you, Wade. Um, so the second part of this question, and I'm not sure if, again, we should uh, maybe direct this person to a loan officer. Um, maybe you guys can answer on here live. Um, but the question is, if I refinance my primary home with a rate and term only, do I have to live in it for a certain amount of time before I can move out and perhaps use it for a rental? Jeff, do you want to take that one or you want me to? Yeah, well, I believe there are, if we're talking about regular conventional mortgages, I believe there is a, an agreement you sign in the deed that says you intend to occupy the property. I think it's for at least a year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yes, you, and that is serious, right? If, if you were to sign that and then very quickly move out, your lender, if they were to find out about it, which they probably would, they had the ability to call the note due. Um, so it's it's serious to, you know, stick to what you what you sign when you close. So if it's going to be a rental, keep it a rental for a year. If you're going to live there, keep it as you're living there for at least a year, and then you, you you're able to do what you want to do. But but there are repercussions to not abiding by the agreement, and most of them are very bad. I, I will say um, that they do have the ability to call the note due, just as they would on a wrap note, that which is. A lot of people do that out there right now. The, the probability, if you say you have an extenuating circumstance and you need to move out of the home, we've even had a teammate on our team who had an extenuating circumstance and had to move out and it was authorized. So we have seen that authorized in the past, but the just point, you definitely want to let your lender know about it. You want to control the communication, make sure they hear from you, that you give an explanation. And it's not just they get a notification that, you know, a new person, a tenant's in there somehow. So in my opinion, I don't want people to be afraid to buy a primary residence or to refi because in most instances, if you say I'm getting transferred for work or, you know, I have some, I lost my job. I have some other legitimate reason that I have to sell. Those things are not, or, or that you have to put a tenant in it. Those things are not going to happen, but you do have to control the communication. But I, in my opinion, if you have a very reasonable explanation, um, that, that will normally happen. The one thing that I would anticipate they would not do for up to a year is give you another owner occupied loan, which would have the lowest possible interest. That that might be difficult to acquire unless you're getting transferred for work or something like that, then you might be able to get away with that. But. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, our next question is, do you think Houston's dependence on the energy will hold the area back when compared to other cities in the state? I'll throw my opinion out there. Um, do I think it is more impacted by oil and gas than the other towns? I think that it's undeniable that it is. Um, do I think that Houston is a far more diversified city than it was in the 1980s whenever oil and gas prices really uh, slowed down the economy significantly and we had home price depreciation at that time? Um, I do not think it's nearly as dependent. Companies like Hewlett Power, Packard and, and other major uh, corporations help prop things up significantly, but it's undeniable the liquencies are higher here. And I do think the only factor is probably oil and gas. So it's something we do need to keep an eye on. Um, and I think it's still one of the most affordable areas, which is a positive for real estate investors, but you do need to keep an eye on the oil and gas uh, situation because uh, it's not just conjecture or guesswork. I mean, there, there are more delinquencies there. So that's a uh, tangible number that says it is something to keep an eye on. Jeff, uh, Jeremy, do you have any? I agree. That? No, I mean, I, it's clearly if you look at the foreclosure numbers, it's um, that's probably it. 
I mean, it'd be silly to say that we aren't um, affected by oil and gas more than most other states, I mean, most other cities for sure. But I don't think it's nearly as bad as it once was. Um, and there are a lot of good things that would balance that out to keep the market in pretty good shape, in my opinion. I get the last quick thing I'd say on that is like the last 18 months in oil and gas have been challenging, but the market is still doing extremely well. So uh, I think that that affects certain pockets, you know, but there are enough other compensating factors and positives to overcome it. So um, I think it would have to get significantly worse for that to, uh, to have a greater impact than it's had thus far. But I, I am interested to see how we're able to work through those, that higher delinquency percentage. And I think workouts and refinances and other things like that will be a big part of that, that solution. All right, guys, we have two more. Um, so my next question is, uh, how do you think coronavirus will impact the market in the next few months? Uh, real estate market? That's what it does. I'm going to give it a stock market. Um, I, I, I think it's going to be more of the same. I don't, I don't expect much of a change. I think the vaccine rollout and you know, the number of infections are going down. So I think it's going to help the economy. Um, I am going to be curious as, as hopefully coronavirus goes away, will that loosen up the listings, right? Will more people, was that something holding people back is fear of having people in their house? That, I'm not sure. I think it was initially. I don't know if it is anymore, but I, I, I'm kind of curious how that's going to play out as the vaccine rolls out and people are less concerned about it. Like, are those listing numbers going to go up? That I'm not sure about. I tend to think they won't be affected by it that much. Yeah, I have. Uh, there have been a lot more positive news about coronavirus recently. Um, I, I did see some John Hopkins expert that said he projects he's been like one of the leading communicators that it, it, it hasn't seemed like there's a lot of. Uh, uh, varying opinions on his credibility, but nonetheless, he he, uh, he said that he anticipates potentially being at herd immunity by some point in the middle part of the year. Yeah, I think he may even said April, May, um, which is a pretty exciting article. So if those things do come to fruition and, and you know, the vaccine takes hold, I, I, I'm i in the same boat as Jeff. I, I don't think it's going to have an adverse impact. I, I would be optimistic, at least at some level, that it should have some positive effects. Do I think that you know, they get coronavirus solved and then, then not solved, but I guess more greatly mitigated. And then all of a sudden appreciation is going to go up above 12%. I, you know, I don't know about that. Like, I, I think maybe it will keep it steady longer. Like maybe it'll stay eight to 12% longer. I don't anticipate Houston going up to 15 or 18% because of positive COVID news. I, I, that's well, not what I anticipate. Yeah, I, I would think if anything, it would have, an, it's possible to have a negative impact more than, more than positive. Because if I'm if it does increase listings, right? There's more supply. Um, prices could go down, um, and maybe there'll be less of a flight to space if coronavirus gets solved. So it would be it wouldn't be this this crazy rush to get a bigger house or get a house. So if anything, it could go down a little bit. Is my opinion. But I don't think it's gonna change much. Listings may increase, and also to our to the point about interest earlier those tend to be ticking up which could slow the, the purchasing the volume of homes yeah. as well i didn't hear what you first said there jeremy i'm sorry um as interest rates continue to go up oh yes sir that could slow the volume yeah but for sure awesome guys thanks and we have one last question this one's for jeremy how do I find homes that have suffered from frozen pipes? You have to call me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Very many, many ways to do that. If, if you are wanting to do wholesaling on your own, we've got a lot of different webinars on that. We do, um, we do primarily texting, mass outbound texting. You can do flyers, you can do um, email blasts, you can do 
pay-per-click. There's many, many different ways. But if you're looking to do them yourselves, I would recommend watching those other webinars and learning about how to do wholesaling on your own. If you are wanting to buy homes that are distressed, then and you're an investor, and you're not necessarily wanting to do the wholesaling portion of it, then I would say, yeah, talk to myself, talk to Daniel on my team who does the dispositions, and then many of the other wholesalers in town as well, and you can get with them, and they will be the ones finding the homes. You can be the one that purchases the homes. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Well, that's it for questions. Um, thank you, everybody, that stayed on for these extra 10 minutes. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're looking forward to next month. Again, we have a really exciting uh, guest speaker. Actually, it'll be this month. It'll be our March update towards the end. Um, we're going to be doing it on the last Thursday of the month for the next two months coming up. So make sure to pencil us in from 12 to 1, and we'll see you then. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.